McLaren is a brand synonymous of motor racing. Formula One is the most obvious connection, but McLaren was also involved with Can-Am racing as well as IndyCar. Founded in 1963 by Bruce McLaren, a former racer himself, it's one of the few brands in the world that invests itself so heavily into racing. It wouldn't surprise you to know when you come to a building like this that everything we do is about attention to detail. But it's not just attention to detail for detail's sake, it's always with an objective in mind and nine times out of ten that objective is winning. We have other businesses where winning isn't necessarily being first across the line, it's about being the best. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day everything we do is about being better than our peers, better than our competitors. I have to ask though, you know, you look at you know, Bruce McLaren's vision and actually what Ron Dennis, uh, how, how has McLaren transpired after all these years to be what it is from those initial ideas? I think it's because it's the, the, the shared value systems that, uh, that Bruce had and that, that Bruce imparted on his team and, uh, and then when Ron took over he had very much those same values but then just took them to a whole new level, was able to bring in, uh, you know, greater finance and, and that gave us the muscle to then develop that vision Got it. and take it into, uh, into other areas. What I love though is that you stay close to your racing history. This is, this is incredible. Well, how can we not stay close to our racing history? I mean, our racing history is, is phenomenal and uh, you know, we've, we've won one in four of every Formula One race we've ever competed in. Unheard. We've, we've been on the podium for 50% of every race we've ever competed in. So it's, it's a, a pedigree and a heritage that we're obviously very proud of. Yeah. We're not an extrovert business, but we, we feel very, very proud uh, inwardly of, of that success. And it's, it's that success that inspires the current generation of people at McLaren to, uh, to try and take it to another level. How do people feel about all of this heritage? Yeah. That, you know, they feel enriched by it. You can't help but feel inspired by it. And it's one of the key reasons that we have it all on display. You know, your, your reaction when you walked in here is no different than anybody's reaction, which is, wow, there's a Senna car or there's a Prost car or whatever it is. Everybody has their particular era that they get excited about. Uh, you know, and for, for me, just as one person, to actually see some of the cars here every day that I've actually stood on the other side of the wire from when I was 12 or 13 years old, yeah. Uh, I, I, mean, I, get, I get tingles, I get yeah. you know, goosebumps just yeah. thinking about it. We've had people break down in tears seeing some of the cars that you've walked past today. Walking into the MTC, it's as if you're walking into a science fiction movie. Long corridors with highly metallic surfaces. You walk through hallways thinking Trent Reznor should score a soundtrack for all the guests to listen to as they enter the place for the first time. Everything is spotless. Everything is clean. You can tell everything is designed obsessively. And I'm not saying that in a cold way. In fact, the architecture allows for so much natural light into the workspaces, it makes you feel awake, alive. This, this building was a vision conceived in the, in the kind of mid to late 90s. Okay. Um, Ron Dennis always wanted, uh, wanted to bring the kind of the federation of companies together under one roof. Mm -hmm. We'd grown exponentially over a period of 20, 25 years. Uh, and we really you know, were, were wanting the benefits of being back as, as one kind of collective. Mm -hmm. um, we then wanted a, a showpiece both for uh, commercial reasons so that we could explain to people the vision of what we're all about mm -hmm. and, and hopefully elicit their investment in us either as, as sponsors, partners, uh, or in some cases investors. Mm -hmm. uh, but also to make sure that we could recruit the best people and get the best people to come and share in what it was that we were trying to build. And this, this facility really does inspire the people who work here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that Ron really was ahead of his time in, in creating something that people would just want to be in, want to be part of, 
uh, as, as well as the success of, of the business itself, to actually come to a place like this is, you know, it's an awe-inspiring environment in which to work. And it's a little like going on stage. You know, you really feel like you have to up your game when you arrive here every morning. It is an inviting experience, which makes sense. The MTC opened in 2003, and Ron Dennis was very influential in its design. Inside, you not only have McLaren Racing, but also McLaren Automotive, and the not-so-well-known McLaren Electronics. Walking in here, you look at this, this is, not, uh, this is not what I was expecting at all. No, this, this, this looks, like this a looks scientific laboratory. I was just going to say, it looks like a laboratory, but yeah. it's, it's not. This is part of uh, McLaren Electronics. Got so uh, this is where ECUs are actually being physically created. Uh, I mean, we're printing circuit boards in there. It's, it, that's that's high-end stuff. It's not the sexy end of the business, but it's, it's very high-end. Ron Dennis wanted the building to attract the best engineers and designers, but more importantly, he wanted to keep them there. Walking the hallways, you can tell everyone who works there has a sense of pride to be working within those walls. It's actually, it's a very selfless culture. I think we attract like-minded people here who ultimately want to win and want to do the best that they can possibly do in whatever role they have. Okay. But they're selfless people who want to come together as a team and understand that actually the old cliche of one plus one equals three, that if, if they can all come together and be the best in their particular discipline, chances are that we're more likely to succeed or to win. And we have a lot to live up to. You know, we have 49 years of success. Uh, in the time that we've been in Formula One, for example, there have been over 100 Formula One teams have failed have come and gone, left Formula One. So this is, this is no place for the, the weak <laughs> or the meek. And uh, you know, we're reminded of those sorts of statistics every year when, when, when people you know, either leave the automotive sector or, or they leave, uh, leave Formula One. And, uh, and that's part of that pressure to, to make sure that we're being the best because it's a slippery pole, either in supercars or in Formula One. It's a slippery pole and those that aren't near the top have a real struggle. Now, past the wind tunnel and the Formula One work bays, we walk down a long hallway, all underground, very James Bond-like. You then hit a, a, a set of stairs, you go up, and then you walk into what is called the McLaren Production Center. This is McLaren Automotive. This is the future of McLaren. So right now, this is the, this is the north end of the MPC. This is a VIP area, this is a hosting suite. So okay. this is basically where potential customers or dignitaries or any type of VIP can come into this area. And from this area, we lead directly out onto the production facility, just around this corner here. Okay. And I think you need to see let's, that. Let's go check it out. So how old is this place? So we've been operating in here now for Whoa, eight months. We are, in, we are flat out production and we have been now since the turn of, uh, turn of the year. We have been at full capacity in terms of our uh, planning requirements for this year. And for sure, um, everything from a production point of view is going absolutely beautifully this at this surreal. moment. It's yes. almost like a clean room and it, and it mimics the MTC but on a different level. Prior to the MP412C, McLaren built my favorite hypercar, the F1. Then after that, the SLR, which was built right alongside the F1 cars. But now, for the new MP412C, it's an entirely new building. The first thing I noticed there was that there was a lot of unused space. McLaren has been around for about 50 years, but McLaren Automotive is essentially an entirely new company. They built the McLaren Production Center knowing they would be building other models besides the MP412C. Actually, what you're looking at now is the best part of 20,000 square meters of, of floor space mm -hmm. uh, on which we wanted to produce the vehicle we worked really hard to make sure that we could integrate all of the, all of the processes that were absolutely critical to ensuring that um, the assembly of this vehicle was felt at an absolute personal level from an operator's point of view, but also gave the customer a really good feeling that he's actually, his ownership experience didn't start when he took the car, it actually started at the placement of order, and therefore if he wanted to visit this facility he could actually come and see his vehicle being birthed. All of the technicians feel as though they're involved in making that person's car. So it's not just a vehicle. 
They accept that they're behind that, he's a customer and a valued customer, and we wanted to make sure that um, his ownership experience started right here from the moment we first loaded any components into the facility. If we keep taking a look down here. So this is phase one right here? So this is absolutely the start of the process. Okay. So this is the MP4-12C monocoque right here? We didn't want any feel of industrialisation in the facility. Okay? We, wanted, we wanted it to be a theatre. Um, it was really important to us that we created environments where everything felt special and yeah. everything felt personal and I think we've achieved that. So what you don't see is you don't see any significant levels of automation, you don't see clunking we'll see chains, you don't see very any conveyors, yeah. you won't see airlines or anything like this. It's all very close, cl uh, quiet, it's all very composed and it's all very simple in its execution. If we take a look at some of the, the, the racking and what have you. Yeah. Um, there are a number of components, such as fastenings and such as brackets and that, where we can clearly hold quite a, a decent level of yeah. stock holding line side. And as you can see with, with things like the um, front longies, we've designed some bespoke stillaging to allow just us to... Just for these parts. Just for these particular <laughs> parts. And we have bespoke stillaging all around the facility. But I think what's a really good um, tactile thing about what you're looking at right now is if you look at the, if you look at the uh, diameter and the radius of the bespoke stillaging, it's absolutely the same as the radius and the diameter <laughs> of the racking. As you can see, this is where the, the vehicle's been more and more progressed through yep, its, uh, its build assembly phase. So the windscreen surround is going on there and the B-pillar casting is going on here. Okay. So even though we have 100% confidence in the facilities and the equipment and the whole process with these guys, and we are 100% confident, that doesn't stop us taking every single body, and it is every single body, and walking into, processing them into the geometric and surface validation station. So this is geometric and surface validation. So basically every single body, even though we're 100% confident it's in a good place, we still want to measure it just to ensure that we don't get any um, quality drift in the overall body's vehicle assembly uh, status. So this so, whole rig here is just for measurement? So this, everything that you see in here is, is absolutely for measurement. So we, we take a lot of surface points, Got we it. take hundreds of surface points, and we take hundreds of geometric points on the vehicle to ensure that we know that the car is in a really good place dimensionally. The body would exit this, these double doors here, okay, which are closed at the moment, and then it will go into, this is the paint facility now. In essence, the vehicle through this paint facility is processed across two skids. The body goes on one particular skid mm -hmm. and all of the other supplementary panels go on to another. Um, this is the single biggest piece of investment in terms of equipment in the whole of MPC. So we pushed all of the potential suppliers um, with regards to paint facilities hard in terms of making sure that in their thinking they got absolutely what we were on about in terms of an insulation. So whilst all of them could have satisfied us technically, that's not a problem, we wanted to make sure that they, this was right as well. This was really important for us to make sure that they understood our philosophies, our methodologies, and they, they, they could clearly understand that from a brand augmentation point of view, whatever they installed absolute, absolutely complemented that. Because what it creates is it creates a completely different mindset of thinking for the technician. It it, what, it, what it demonstrates to the technician is that we've thought about their working environment as much as we have the product and, and the customer. Because if, if we create the perfect working environment for them, they can, only, we, they can only ever give their best of themselves. And I actually think you get that natural transfer into the, into the vehicle then, and you get an uplift of inbuilt uh, vehicle processing quality. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So what you're seeing here now is um, we're seeing the, um, this, is the, this is what we call skid two, okay. and it's just had its base coat applied. That won't go forward until they've, they've clear coat, they put the clear coat on, on those particular booths here. The whole facility, even though we, we designed the facility such that if we wanted to put robots in here, we could. And whilst robots have got great dexterity, and they have, and you can put all sorts of convoluted and complicated pro, uh, programs into them, there's nothing more dexterous than the human. And what a robot doesn't have as well, he doesn't have the eye as well. It's just, uh, it's just a, it's an application process. Okay, there's nothing emotional about it. It's very, it's very clinical, it's just application. Here, 
these guys can take a view on whether they, they've done, whether they think they've done something absolutely the right way or not, and they, they've got an opportunity to, to do a level of uh, reparation in, in the booth should a mistake have been made, or should they see something on the vehicle that they think, oh, that doesn't look quite right, there's an opportunity here to do that reparation. So this is, this, this is an audit line, and so basically, when the vehicle's had its clear coat put on, it goes into the oven through those glass doors there, exits here, and this is the first point we do some inspection. Every single vehicle gets a full surface quality inspection, but the great thing about this facility is we have enough flexibility in here to always do a fix the same day, such that it doesn't disrupt our output requirements for the process. So it comes all the way down this, this particular facility here, shuttles across again, and then goes into the polishing and final finish side. Every single car gets a full, a full flattened polish so that we raise the um, optical aspect of the vehicle. So we, we create a far greater depth, uh, level of depth on the colour itself. So you can actually look into the colour and you're not just looking at surface, you're actually looking into the colour. Everything you see on the car, we like to say it's done for a reason, which means that everything that you see has an effect on the overall performance of the car. And more so also, you know, when they do say form uh, follows function, we don't really, that, that sounds, you know, nice and everything, but with this car, pretty much it's form equals function. What looks right works. What we've done is, of course, you have the two main uh, intakes on the front, which are for your intercoolers. Mm -hmm. uh, they specifically have to get a lot of air in there very efficiently and, uh, and, and do the job of cooling. But also we have what we call a splitter right here in the front, and that creates a lot of downforce, creates the, uh, the, right, the right feel for the road with the car. Um, this area is very critical underneath. Uh, if you rub your hand underneath, you'll feel some what we call diblets. They're little bumps oh, yeah. that actually straighten out the airflow underneath, things yeah. that you don't even see, but they're on the car. I mean, every detail is really, really wow. taken to the max on this car. This is what we call biomimicry. There's a lot of influence from what really works in, in some organisms in the world that uh, use this type of design feature for, for, for purpose, basically. We have had a little bit of freedom with the headlights. Um, this is where you can really st start to give the car a little bit of a um, unique look. It's almost as if it's the eyes of the person. Yeah. Uh, eyes do give it, uh, give people a lot of character. So we're not really uh, um, influencing too much of the technology here. We are using high-tech Xenon lamps, but you can see that the uh, actual form of your daytime running lamps sort of creates the feel of the McLaren logo. Uh -huh. We let the, the light bleed through these three little uh, slots here, which are almost like fins or gills. Gills, off that's of exactly what I was going to describe as gills. And that, that sort of, when you're in the front, you look back and you see that, it really gives the car its own cool. unique look to it. Another thing that we've really concentrated on is keeping the cowl, uh, the back of the hood, as low as we can for full, optimal forward visibility. Uh, so we pushed it quite far down, that gives us um, a, a great viewing angle from, from the driver's position. And one of the funny things that you would uh, not really notice unless you're actually sitting in the car, it's very interesting, is that the center point of the wheel is directly over the highest point, or directly under the highest point of the fender, which means when you're actually sitting down, you know where your wheel is a place to hit the apex. Because you see it. That's because you know that yeah. the farthest point you're looking at, or the highest point, is actually the uh, center of the wheel, so you can really place it uh, Interesting. precisely that way. Really important is this actually this blade that we have here on the side, and although it looks kind of like an element that we sat down and designed and had fun with, um, it really came out of the, uh, the computer, yeah. out of uh, what we call uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in our intent to make the car as small as possible and center all the weight towards the center of the car, we've actually turned the radiators um, parallel to the uh, direction of the car mm -hmm. to get the weight and the mass all towards the middle. So this blade here uh, has been done on the computer such that it generates or actually keeps the air attached to it and it throws it in on an accelerated curve so uh, you get plenty of cooling that way. So this blade is and very, very design. necessary. It adds, of course it adds flavor to the car, makes it more unique, but it's there for a reason as I said. Another element that I really like on the car is uh, what we call the air brake yep. on the back of the car. And uh, it's not really, we don't consider it a spoiler, it's not even used as a spoiler. It's basically um, a way of uh, uh, adjusting the braking on the car, so anytime you brake in anger, 
uh, and anger. I like that. You're well, <laughs> you know, with intent to break, I guess, to slow down. Uh, it goes 90 degrees, and what happens then is that the uh, the, the um, uh, center of gravity actually uh, moves back towards the back of the car and puts more weight on the back wheel, so that you can actually use the brakes in the rear a little bit more. A lot of the action is actually done by the wind itself, not by pushing it up, but it. releasing it and letting it go up on its own. Got it. One of the design. Uh, words that we use a lot in the cars to actually, for, for the language, is actually to almost like shrink wrap the surface. Yeah. Whereas a lot of cars um, add volume. What we're trying here to do is take away volume, so you're almost like shrink wrapping the metal over the hard points, which are suspension mounts or yeah. vision angles or head clearance angles or whatever. Um, so, so we're trying to minimize, take weight out of the car by reducing the amount of surface area we have on it. Yeah. So this is, this is basically the start of the trim and final. Uh, part of the process. This is where we start layering the car and installing it ready for ready oh, for us no. to take it to a point of... No wiring harness? Wiring harness. Wiring harness. Sim okay. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So we, we, we have the opportunity of being able to produce the same amount of cars in this facility as any of our competitors with yeah. their levels of industrialisation. You, you don't actually need that and we wanted to create a different blueprint for how to build cars. Yeah. And so if we take a look at these vehicle ramps here these are a standard vehicle ramp, um, but we wanted to make sure that we put some nice architectural cladding around it, and we made sure that we set all of the services underneath the tiles as well. So these are, you do not see any lines, and that's why everything is really clean. And it was really important to us that we didn't see trailing airlines, and we didn't see trailing cables. Yeah. This is a really interesting feature in the facility. Um, again, same diameter, yep, same, same diameter. radius. Yeah. But what's really interesting here is that all of the services are in a trench here. Got it. So we have this trench that runs the full length of the building. We have those in three or four places uh, across, the, across yeah. the building. All of the services actually go feed up through the back of these um, tool cabinets here so that all of the IT functionality is fed up, through, fed up through here as well so you don't see any cables here. And if you need to use compressed air or you need to use single phase electrics, okay, it's all embedded within the facility and you just don't see any cabling. Every single, every single operator is, um, is accountable for his work. Um, they work with what we call, we have this like access swipe yeah. system. So when the car comes into the facility, every single operator um, has to swipe his card. If we take a look here, yep. I won't do it because it means I'll have to start assembling parts mm -hmm. of the car. But he will swipe his card across the, the, the reader there. And then that locks in personally into that particular vehicle to undertake a certain amount of work He's on that particular car. He's absolutely 100% responsible. Now we're getting into the final stages. I'm uh, seeing a bunch of grease pen on here. So 248, 248. So these, that's so how you identify the That's how we identify, the absolutely. So this particular panel was painted with this particular body so that we absolutely make sure that we don't get any uh, inconsistencies with colour matching or anything like this. Got it. Um, and not only that, uh, we want to make sure that this particular uh, component was, is going to be reset with this particular door. Got so it. we uh, get a really good fit and finish from a gap and profile point of view as well. So what we're doing here now on this particular station, this is the geometry setup uh, lift. This is basically where we do tow, camber, yep. ride heights and all of that sort of thing in readiness for when we go into the dynamic rig. This is where we, we put the car through any, its first real dynamic load. So we do an engine fire up uh, further upstream of the process, and this is where we put the car through some dynamic load here now. So basically, we bring the car up to temperature, check most of the uh, electrical systems are working, and all of the all of the brains in the in the in the, in the vehicle are, are communicating with each other. We do some uh, brake um, activity, we do some acceleration, deceleration, but just generally put the car through some immediate dynamic loads. Yeah. So in essence, the vehicle goes through dynamic rig into the monsoon where we give it a full saturation of water, I don't know, 16,000 litres in about six or seven minutes. It's a huge amount of that water. Um, car exits there. It then gets prepared, uh, ready for external drive appraisal. Okay. It will leave through that door there, okay. goes out in its external drive appraisal, where we put it through some more aggressive loads. One of the things, uh, when we were landscaping the whole exterior, of the, uh, ex uh, the outside of the facility, what was really uh, important to us was to try and optimise the land around us as well. So we've got a cobbled um, we've got cobbled sections of roadway out there which allow us to shake and rattle the car a little bit just to loosen anything up before we actually take it down the highways and buy it. Obviously during the, the wetter seasons in the year, the car could come back with some muck and, and what have you on it. And that's why we just have this wash down rig here now. So we just give the underside a quick wash down and just make sure that the, the, the vehicle gets, is fully cleaned before it exits here. It would sit normally on here, 
for 45 minutes just to have a final drip dry. And we take a look at the vehicle after it's been out on an external drive. Um, and what we do is we're basically checking to make sure that nothing has worked loose, there are no weeps or leaks or anything like that from any of the joints. Yeah. Um, there's, no, there's been no displacement of any harness clips or anything like this and Got everything it. is absolutely how, how we want it to be. A very, very critical station. We're getting ourselves ready to hand the car over to the auditors with what we perceive to be a car that is acceptable for the customer. Okay? The auditors then give it a, a really thorough investigation mm -hmm. and interrogation and they, again, they go to the nth degree of checking uh, surface quality, checking fit and finish, checking functionality of all of the systems. So that's it, this is, these cars go to the customers, right? These cars are ready to go to the customer. So where's, where's the car I'm driving? Unfortunately, it's not one of these, but okay. just for you, we have one back at base. Cool, okay. thank you.